Good morning and welcome back to Real Estate Live UK. And um, for those of you who are just joining this as poten potentially your first session that you've um, been with us for, uh, this is a week of virtual events which takes place three times a year and this is our final week of events for 2021. Um, the week-long programme is brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors and a big thank you to all of the organisations that have contributed to the fantastic lineup taking place this week. Um, during the one-hour sessions, places across the UK are showcasing investment opportunities and industry-leading industry experts from um, the public and the private sectors um, discussing new ideas and topical issues relating to property. Um, and if you're interested in signing up for any other sessions, um, you can have a look on our website, realestatelive.co.uk, to see what else is coming up. And we'll also talk about some of the sessions taking place today at the end of this one-hour panel. Um, so the session that's about to begin is our Sustainable Places keynote which is one of our three themed keynotes um, alongside tomorrow's session on culture and community and Friday's focus on health and wellness. Um, so there's three of the topics that we've been discussing across many of our sessions this week, but um, this one is our, our keynote introduction to the topic. So looking forward to the next hour of discussion um, and hopefully you, the audience, are also looking forward to it. Um, and we'd really like your interaction and engagement in the panel. So um, we'd just like to remind you that you can ask questions of the panel via Zoom's Q&A feature, um, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, and um, our chair for the session will aim to come to as many of those as possible as we move into the debate. And now I'm really pleased to hand over to our chair for this conversation, John Whitaker, who's a senior editor at Investment Monitor. So John, over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this keynote session on sustainable places at Real Estate Live 2021. Bonnie said, my name is John Whitaker, Senior Editor at Investment Monitor, and today I am joined by an expert panel to discuss how sustainable development can support sustainable economies. On the panel for this discussion is Jim Coleman, Head of Economics at WSP, Stuart Black, Area Manager for Moray, Highlands and Island Enterprise, Callie Persich of Belfast City Council, Maria Adebowali Swartz, CEO, Foundation for Future London, and Sean Keyes, Managing Director, Sutcliffe and Liverpool Place Partnership. Welcome to you all. Now, the thrust of our discussion today will be focusing on managing the costs of deliver, uh, deliver, uh, delivering sustainable uh, sustainability and ensuring broad ranging benefits for local communities as we drive towards net zero. If anyone in the audience wants to submit a question during the discussion, uh, please do so via the platform, um, as Bonnie said, via the Q&A uh, section, um, and we will try and answer as many of those questions as possible during the Q&A part of this session. But first of all, to start our discussion, I want to turn to Stuart Black and ask what Murray is doing to become a more sustainable place. Stuart, please. Yes, thanks very much uh, for your introduction, John, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Stuart Black. I'm Highlands and Islands Enterprise Area Manager for Murray. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what we do at Highlands and Islands Enterprise and how rural areas are affected by what's happening in the real estate market. So firstly, um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is the Scottish Government's regional development agency for the north and west of Scotland. We cover 51% of the land mass of Scotland, so we cover a very large geographic area. Um, we have around 300 staff and a budget of £85 million pounds. We, we operate through eight area teams, and I look after all of the area teams, but with a particular focus on Murray, which is the, the focus of today. So in Murray, we have a budget of around three million pounds per, per annum. Now, Murray has a population of about 100,000, and the main town is, is Elgin, which is about a quarter of the, the population. Um, it's located broadly between Aberdeen and Inverness, if you know the, the north of Scotland. Um, probably our most famous industry is the whisky industry, and we have 50 or so malt whisky distilleries. Uh, so it's a great place to come if you like uh, visiting whisky distilleries. And the whisky industry is really significant because it's one of UK. In fact, the whisky sector is the UK's largest food and drink export, worth about four billion pounds per annum. So it's very significant. Um, and we have lots of uh, distilleries, and they they look 10 years ahead to their market. So a lot of them are already working on becoming net zero because they think the customer of the future is going to want uh, a net zero product. So Murray is, is interesting. We have 33% of our land area is forested. So that's the highest in Scotland. So if you think about carbon sinks, that's a really important in, um, area for, for land use. And in fact, in Scotland, there's a lot of land being bought, sometimes um, with communities not really in favour by large landowners 
buying for, for carbon sinks. We also produce a lot of uh, renewable energy. There are two huge offshore wind farms in the Murray Firth. The first one's called the Beertsis Wind Farm. It produces um, around 600 megawatts of, of power. That's enough for 450,000 homes. It's huge. But the second one is even bigger. That's Murray East, and that's 950 megawatts, which is uh, a really huge um, offshore wind farm. And those wind farms all come ashore in Murray. And that offers us opportunities for things like hydrogen production, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have a lot of manufacturing in Murray, and we also have a big presence of the RAF. The RAF is interesting as well because, um, along with other parts of defence, they need to think about net zero as well. And we have nine Poseidon, uh, Boeing Poseidon aircraft based in, in Murray. So the Murray Council has set a target of being net zero by 2030 for all its operations. I think we'll be hearing about how public sector is leading this. Um, the whiskey industry, many of the key players have also said that, that they want to be net zero by, by 2030. The Scottish government target is ahead of the, of the UK government target. It's net zero by 2045. And importantly, a 75% reduction by 2030. So that's only um, eight, nine years away, if you think about it. There, it. Locally, there are a number of things that are being done by the public sector. We have the Murray uh, Climate Action Steering Group. And that includes um, most of the public sector bodies in the area, but also the, the private sector through the Murray Chamber of Commerce. We also have a climate assembly, which is a community led initiative. Murray's interesting. We have something here called the Fintorn Foundation, and it was set up in the 60s. It's West Coast American type uh, people who came to Murray and they were really forward thinking about renewables, about recycling. And there's been some spin out businesses from that. As I mentioned before, we're looking at hydrogen because if you have offshore wind, you can produce green hydrogen and hydrogen has the potential to replace natural gas in many of our uh, heating systems. And you, I'm sure you'll have heard about that this week. Um, we're, we're looking at how we put net zero into our property as well. And we have a, an enterprise park that we're, that we're responsible for as HIE. And we have a lot of green technology on that park. We also have around half the parks devoted to open space so that people working in the park can enjoy the environment. We get people coming out from the local town to, to walk their dogs there, Not something that happens in many business parks. Um, we've also put in lots of charging points for electric vehicles. One of our key tenants on the park is a company called Orbex, and they're um, behind the UK's small satellite launch um, opportunity. And we have in Space Sub Sutherland, the foremost site for launching satellites. And they're going to be uh, using biomethane, so it's a very green uh, satellite launch. So that's just some of the things that we're doing in, in Murray. It's a rural area seeking to be an exemplar in zero. Local government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the private and voluntary sector all working together. I've mentioned the importance of, of the whiskey sector, so it's a UK significant sector. But also in rural areas, there are many opportunities around digital and around home working. And COVID's illustrated that. In fact, I'm talking to you from my, my home, as you'd imagine, on the banks of the River Spey, uh, pretty close to some of the biggest distilleries in the in the world, uh, like Macallan. So digital has really enabled people to work much more remotely, and that's driving property prices and encouraging people to move into rural areas and work from home. So that, that's some of the things we're doing in Murray. Look forward to your questions. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks, Stuart. So we're going to move from uh, the very rural uh, setting of Murray um, to a, a much more uh, urban environment now. I'm going to bring Callie into the conversation to discuss uh, sustainability plans around uh, Belfast. So I think you have a short presentation for us. I do. So thank you very much. So I've been asked to talk about how we are building sustainable, accessible and inclusive Belfast that benefits our local people. So we're doing this through our brand new strategy that was published for consultation last week, a bolder vision for Belfast. So next slide. Thanks. So there's three ways I want to talk to you about that we're building a more sustainable city. The first is about how through a bolder vision, we're reimagining public space, creating green, walkable, cyclable network of spaces. This is about quality of life, securing sustainable investment and focusing on health and well-being. So in our city, we have offices. We have student accommodation, but what we're doing is we're driving forward housing-led regeneration. And to do this, we're warming up spaces. We're reimagining public space. So what I'm illustrating here is how we're building sustainable communities in our city. So we de delivered 
the Cathedral Gardens, which is the bright, colorful visual that you see there. This is the first multifunctional, family-friendly space in our city. Similarly, the Belfast Harbor Commissioners, one of our partners in the city, is taking forward a new public park. And this is about transforming car parking, surface level car parking into blue and green infrastructure. And critically throughout this, we're using art and culture to create that vibrancy, create places and create the, the spaces that people want to visit and where people want to live. Next slide. So cities are a place of interaction and exchange, and we believe cities will be back. And what we're doing in Belfast is refreshing our city center to welcome people back, but also create new destinations. So we're drawing on what's distinctive to us. And some of this is about our entries and lanes, our fine urban grain that has history and interest for people. So we have an entire program, including a lighting strategy that makes these safe and welcoming and drives footfall to those local businesses. We also have a brand new visitor attraction in the city coming forward, and it's called it's part of our city deal, and it's called the Belfast Story. So it's more than just tourism. It's actually another reason to come into the city center. It's about diversification. And so this is about the stories of Belfast, the past, present, and future. And like other cities, we've worked with the private sector all throughout COVID. So we are looking at reimagining road space, reallocating this to create new local places where people want to congregate, where people can meet up again and to help businesses flourish. Next slide, please. And just finally, for us, sustainable communities in Belfast are connected communities. And this is one of our challenges in, in Belfast. But change is happening at scale in relation to connectivity and active travel, especially supported by our new vision. So Belfast is a congested city. You will read about this. But 35% of our population do not own cars. And those tend to be more deprived communities surrounding our city center. So it's critical that we connect them to Belfast for those opportunities that the city can bring. So in this case, we've expanded our Belfast bike share. We have invested into two new active travel hubs in the city, one on each side as bookends to support students that are coming in, but as well as businesses to start diversifying and getting modal change available for people. And then finally, we have the new 175 million pound Weaver's Cross development. And this is about strategic infrastructure, connecting communities and bringing more sustainable carbon neutral choices to Belfast. Thank you. Thanks, Gally. Um, okay, we're going to keep with the urban theme. Um, and I'm going to go over to Sean now and ask him um, about Liverpool, his experiences in Liverpool. Obviously, large cities are significant contributors to carbon emissions. So um, uh, what what's, should be their approach to sustainability and what is the approach being taken by Liverpool? Okay, good morning. I've just uh, left the Liverpool Chamber of Commerce meeting uh, with Chief Executive of Liverpool City Council came over. So uh, sustainability is right at the top of uh, Liverpool's agenda, uh, but I would probably say it's on the top of most big cities' agenda. So I'm not just going to talk from a perspective of Liverpool in my next couple of minutes. Um, what, what we're seeing uh, in the region is that... Um, Sustainability has jumped right up the agenda as a result of, of COVID and everybody's taking it now seriously. So what was happening previously, it was paying a little bit of lip service to, to sustainable issues, but now it needs to jump right up the agenda. What's happening recently with the increased energy costs is highlighting for, for that most homes uh, are not suitable. Is we don't have one single home in the UK that's... Uh, net zero full net zero so most homes actually require energy to keep them keep them running um liverpool does have one of the healthiest buildings which is the spine which we're visiting later in the week which is it is an energy efficient building and it is sustainable in, in other ways 
moving close to uh, net zero is is a goal within the city we see it as an opportunity uh, to create wealth to create jobs so for, for sustainability to truly work uh, it needs to obviously help the environment but also improve the uh, prospects and the opportunities for the society so we see that uh, retrofitting uh, possibly older properties and improving the insulation around the uh, older properties will be a huge huge advantage it will be a wealth generator it will be a job generator and for uh, large uh, cities that have t- traditionally had higher unemployment, it will create lower skilled jobs. With one word of caution uh, is that we need to do to undertake these to the right level of quality to obviously uh, prevent the situation that's happened in Grenfell from reoccurring. Um, but there's a huge opportunity for that to happen. Uh, one other thing in, that's going on in, in the region is just offshore. We've got plenty of wind energy coming in and we need to tap these type of resources to improve our environment and bring things down. There's something that's happening in the, in the wider UK, which is Insulate UK. I'm not necessarily a believer of that type of protest, but the principle of insulating every home in the UK to a much higher standard it seems to me as an engineer so obvious a way to reduce energy bills and re- improve sustainabilities one final thing is that the construction industry which is what i am is a is a large polluter so we need to put a higher emphasis on retaining old buildings if you demolish a building and rebuild it, the building again you get full vat on your development if you actually do refurbishments to an older property it's actually harder to get the vat back so thank you very much john right um plenty of food for thought there um maria i'm going to come over to you now um and ask you about large regeneration projects in london um uh, such as the olympic park regeneration um and how um, they've been approached in a way to balance what Sean was talking about, that um, uh, delivering sustainability, uh, sustainability while also delivering um, the benefits to the local community. Sure. So um, I'm the CEO of the Foundation Future London. It's a charity fund and fundraiser. And it's focusing on investing in people, place, culture and art and innovation and creativity. So in to do this, we have to be deeply committed to sustainability and net zero. And we're supporting four boroughs in East London, Hackney, Newham, Tower Hamlets and Walden Forest. And that's home to approximately one and a quarter million people and jobs to far many more. Um, London's current commitment is net zero carbon by 2030, and that will also be ours as an organisation. Um, the foundation works very closely with colleagues at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, and our role is to invest in London communities so they benefit from a new East Bank and Stratford Water Cultural Front, um, which is part of the Queen Elizabeth Park and um, part of that regeneration area. And you'll see, if you ever get the opportunity to walk through the park, all of the buildings coming up. And so the fact that we are committed to net zero and building um building institutions and their homes um, with a net zero and climate change agenda is really crucial. What's vital to us is that we care about the environment and that we support people being able to care for the environment. And that includes us funding and investing in programs. Um, We need always to remember the planet and its environment is the mother of all places when we talk about placemaking, it's planet Earth. So therefore for us caring about the planet and focusing on sustainability is ultimately about caring for people their physical, mental and spiritual well-being. And C19, as everyone has said earlier, is you know, absolutely crucial for creating and the need for healthy homes and inclusive spaces. If you look at why, how we're guided, um, we use the Sustainable Development Goals, and so we're guided by SDG 11, um, making cities and human settlements um, sustainable and safe. Also SDG 4, which is really important, that all everything we do around net zero has to be focusing around inclusivity and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong opportunities. And finally, SDG 8 as well, about promoting inclusive, sustainable economic growth, which produces employment and decent work, as my colleague said earlier. Um, As a foundation, we're also working with the Association of Charitable Foundations. This has a pillar to help all charities actually shape and enhance their commitment to sustainable development. I should say that, you know, as a funder and an investor, we also make sure that our commitment is illustrated by who we work with. And so we choose partners who are our donors who have strong commitments to ESG. That includes Westfield Stratford City and City of London, and also working with City Hall, who are all deeply committed to those things. 
If you want to look at how we develop it, um, sustainable development, sustainability within the four boroughs, here are some examples. In Hackney, we're working with architect who is delivering and working with local authorities around creating vertical farming solutions for inner city spaces. Um, and this is actually growing a space, having a space in void spaces between buildings and unused parks. In Waltham Forest, we're also working with designing um, in between spaces, which we've noticed in London, there's so many spaces that we have that actually aren't been designed um, to allow people to walk through, to enjoy those spaces without having to go near polluted roads. In Newham, um, we're also developing the public art walk with Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and also worked for Stratford City in Tower Hamlets. We have nine young students who have joined forces with older women in local communities to explore the climate change emergency and how they can use the power of creativity to deliver um, net zero. And finally, one of the things that we focus on in our work is social value placemaking, and that's been absolutely crucial. And some people don't quite understand what that means, but for us, it's about measuring benefits of intervention to a particular community. And if people want to know more, then look at the London Sustainable Development Commission Social Value Committee Report, which is called the Social Value Regeneration Report. But as social value is full of impact and programmes across social, environmental, and economic concerns. So what we have to do is capture the understanding of well-being, strength of relationships and physical environment in the local area and understand how that captures the environmental and economic value. But to finish, social value and regeneration provide creative opportunities, but they tell the story of locality and they're a connector for exploring sustainability through creative arts, culture, innovation, and crucially jobs and inclusive places. Finishing off, creative and social value placemaking will help increase skills. It invests in community assets and a sense of, and a sense of ownership. So whether that's involved in communities and public realm, that has to be crucial. And such public artwork in spaces as Stratford Waterfront are co-designed with local communities. And we always make sure that young people are also equally equipped to be the future architects and planners and designers that really make sure that zero uh, carbon happens. Brilliant. Thank you, Maria. Um, before I uh, turn over to Jim, just a reminder that uh, if you want to put any questions to the panellists, um, uh, please do so via the, the Q&A uh, functionality. We've already had a couple of cracking questions, which I will get um, round to um, uh, shortly, but please um, uh, interact as much as possible with us while, while everyone's on screen. Jim, I want to come over to you because we've heard lots of um, fantastic, innovative uh, plans uh, expressed by all the panellists so far about uh, ways to deliver uh, sustainability in, in their different areas. Um, I want to ask you about the cost implications of that um, and whether the, the required funding mechanisms are there to, to realise a lot of these goals that places across the country have. Okay, thank you, John. Um, it's great to hear all about all the, the different projects. The good thing about going last in the panel, you get to hear everyone else's presentation, so it's fantastic to hear all these examples. Um, I'm Head of Economics at WSP. Um, for those of us, for those who don't know WSP, we're an engineering-led advisory um, firm. I'm head of economics and I lead the economics practice. So we do a lot of work which is really around the economics of places and um, economics of infrastructure and making places um, more economically resilient and sustainable. Um, thinking about the cost side of sustainability, I think the first question is, and it's illustrated by what everyone's been talking about, it's what is it we're looking at? Sustainability covers so many different um, dimensions, possible projects, possible interventions. You know, what is it we're talking about? Is it a physical form of sustainability intervention? Is it about buildings? Is it about housing? Is it about infrastructure? Or um, is it about behavior change? which I think is half the battle in getting to net zero. We all have to change our behavior. And all of the different interventions, all the different ways in which we might tackle sustainability, um, they have different cost structures. They have different cost parameters. It can become very complex. I think if you go to any particular part in the country, they're trying to do a blend of different types of initiatives, different types of interventions. So the whole kind of costing structure can become quite complex it's quite a it's quite a challenge sometimes i think we're in a bit of a transition period at the moment in terms of how things are costed um 
I think it, it's probably fair to say that if we're looking at kind of quite innovative sustainability solutions, they could probably come with a cost premium at the moment. Um, if you're looking at sustainable buildings, if you're looking at sustainable places, you're looking at different types of materials, different skill needs, there's probably a cost associated um, with that. But I think we must never disassociate the benefits from the costs, even though there might be a cost premium at the moment, um, the benefits could be quite substantial and that could be very practical things like reduced running costs for buildings or reduced maintenance costs, or it could be kind of resilience benefits where we reduce the cost associated with flooding or the cost associated with climate impacts. There can be benefits, as we've already heard, around new types of skill development opportunities, new types of business opportunities, et cetera. So even though there might be a cost premium, there's probably also a benefit premium as well. There's a question about when you incur the cost and when you receive the benefit it, of course, um, but things are changing. We, we've, uh, I think, as different technologies, different practices, different materials, as they reach a kind of critical mass point, or as we get economies of scale, of course, the cost um, starts to come down. And Stuart and Shonda both talked about offshore wind, and we've seen huge reductions in the cost of operation in offshore wind. You know, renewable energy from offshore sources now very, very viable. It's very cost effective. Now, so I think we, you know, the things are in a state of flux. And I think hopefully, as these technologies and new materials, new ways of doing things, as they, as they reach a critical mass point, we we'll see things shifting there. I think. I mean, another thing to think about in terms of of that really is is how the government seeks to shape the sustainability agenda. We might see things like carbon pricing. We'll see more regulation, probably. We'll see more standards being introduced to buildings, for example. And that will shift the market towards more sustainable ways of doing things. And that also might have a cost um, reducing impact, I think. On the funding side, because everybody um, wants to know about funding, how to fund these things. I think the um, the climate challenge, the sustainability challenge and getting to net zero with all the various targets, 2050 and all the local targets that kind of descend from that, I think government spending, public spending is not is never going to be enough to address all of the the multiple challenges across across the country. So it's inevitably a relationship between how the government funds things and how and how the private sector funds as well. And I think one of the big roles for government is to provide an enabling um, structure or an enabling environment to in, to allow funds, private funding to come into projects. We're seeing a huge increase in the range of sources of private finance which are signing up to ESG commitments or to, to social impact commitments as, as Maria was talking about. There's a lot of funding out, there's a lot of private finance out there which is looking for um, ESG related impacts is looking for green um, projects and the disjoint at the moment is trying to get the finance into into these areas and it needs a lot more in the way of if you like projectization or concept development you know a clear concept a clear project that funding can flow into with a very clear assessment of the return on investment green finance is like any finance it's looking for strong return on investment if the funding is coming from pension funds and you need to pay people's pensions you need a strong return so it's trying to get these things to um to line up i think again governments um in how it regulates how it provides incentives i think um is is very important all of these things are in a state of flux at the moment. It's a lot of transition. And I think that's the challenge because we need to move very, very quickly in getting these types of activities, these types of projects up and running if we're going to meet a net zero goal. So we need to somehow learn to deal with the degree of transition and the degree of uncertainty at the moment, I think. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jim. Um, uh, before we um, we move on to other questions, there's been a request, uh, Maria. I think you mentioned the source earlier that people should um, uh, check out uh, in terms of um, uh, social value placemaking, and we just had a request for for that to be repeated. Okay, so the place to go to is the London Sustainable Development Committee, and there's a social value report that's been written. And the LSDC are um, advisors to the mayor um, regarding uh, a whole heap of things around sustainable developments. But it's called, um, so yeah, I hope that's 
enough information. <laughs> Social Value yeah. Regeneration, LSDC, you'll find it. Great, thank you for that, Maria. Um, so uh, Jim started to talk about the the, the role of government. Um, obviously, the, the Tory conference is going on as we uh, speak. Um, I believe Michael Gove is due to speak today. Is it um, on uh, on the levelling up agenda? So we're all waiting with bated breath. I'm sure to see what uh, he's got to say uh, about that. Uh, but I'm intrigued to know what the panel thinks um, in terms of. Um, whether the government, what the government has proposed so far in terms of levelling up is, um, is is doing enough to help localities uh, achieve their sustainability goals. And is there more that they should be doing? And if so, what? So uh, with that hot potato, I'm going to first of all throw that over to Stuart. <laughs> Well, um, thanks for that one, John. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, of course, we have a different government in Scotland. The Scottish government is uh, not, not the same government as the, the UK government. And the Scottish government is really committed to um, net zero. The, the targets are more ambitious than the UK targets. And there's big money available through Scottish government for some of these programmes. Um, for example, they have a local heat network programme, which is designed to encourage more Scandinavian style of uh, collective heating uh, into residential and urban areas. And they also have an industrial energy transformation fund, which is shifting uh, companies and businesses into low carbon uh, sources of heat. But going back to your question, which is maybe more about the UK government, and there is a big concern in Scotland. We, we were a significant beneficiary from European funds. And of course, all of those funds have gone and they're being replaced by the um, levelling up funding, the, uh, the money through um, UK government. And it's very uncertain compared to what we had in the past. We, we knew where we stood with European funds and we've had literally hundreds of millions of pounds, particularly into rural areas like the Highlands and Islands through the uh, European Regional Development Fund, European Social Fund. So there's there doesn't appear to be the same level of funding. I think that's the first case. It's also fairly piecemeal in that local authorities bid for it. There's around, I think, 20 million pounds per parliamentary constituency, which is Again, an interesting way of looking at things. Um, and our, our concern is that the level of funding just doesn't match what was there before. And also the, the role of uh, agencies like Highlands and Islands Enterprise in, in having some input to that funding is much more limited than it was in the past. It seems to be a, a route through straight into councils, some of whom are very small and probably lack the, the necessary resource to, to be able to deal with the funding. So we have some significant concerns about the, the way the UK government is doing this. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And I think that's a, an interesting point around EU funding. I, I'd done some analysis previously about um, funding from the EIB, particularly uh, in the years leading up to Brexit. And the UK was by far the biggest recipient of the EIB infrastructure funding in the years leading up to Brexit. And the types of projects that it was supporting were offshore wind farms and other types of green projects, which, as Jim talked about, there was a price premium to um, in the uh, original developmental years of that technology. But that's paying dividends now. And, and so it's it's interesting whether the UK, I don't think it's yet clear whether the UK government is, is willing to play the same role. Um, I guess, um, uh, and really putting a lot of uh, investment behind um, early stage technologies. Um, Sean, I don't know if you've you've got some thoughts around this about um, uh, your message to the the, the, the Tory Party conference <laughs> this week. Or yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I am apolitical. Um, in terms of levelling up, levelling up uh, doesn't just mean um, energy. It means about people. It means about and they, unfortunately, there's too much money spent in London, more of them need to be spent into the regions. That doesn't necessarily mean we don't want a fabulous city like London to thrive. In terms of new technologies, there is an opportunity. And I think one of the questions there was return periods. If, if some of the renewables have return periods of 10 or 15 or 20 years, that's probably, from, from a personal investment point of view, is probably acceptable. But most businesses are looking for much higher returns than that. So there needs to be some funding gap uh, that's brought in. So a fairly simple one that lots of people have done, they put solar panels on the roofs. And they, they've typically got 10 to 20-year return periods. And 
the government needs to continue that subsidy and encourage people to do it. And that will have a huge impact on the amount of energy that we, we use and that it will massively reduce our contribution to a greenhouse gases. We sometimes forget that we are individuals and if we have millions and billions of individuals making small contributions, that will make the impact that we're all looking for. Brilliant. And I wanted to um, uh, touch on one of the other questions that was brought up, and it was concerns around um, uh, efforts towards sustainability or net zero often mean less roads or more pedestrianisation. And someone was just raising the concerns of how much, uh, as part of those uh, plans, thinking goes into uh, facilitating um, uh, road access to businesses and also to um, uh, people uh, with mobility issues who who their lives may be affected by these changes to city centres, which you know uh, are, are obviously intended to uh, have a a large uh, sustainability impact, but may have un other unintended consequences. I don't know if Kelly or Maria would like to pick up on that point. Yeah, I think um, it's it's something always worth looking at and striving for. I, I don't think that sustainability stops. If we do sustainability right, actually, it's about better inclusive spaces. And so certainly for the foundation, we wouldn't fund anything whereby it's creating a space which then locks out other people in regards to accessibility. Um, and so I think that's something that we do need to keep an eye on. Um, but from what we can see that's happening in East London and Queen, around Queen Elizabeth Park and the new cultural quarter at East Bank, we're looking very closely at making sure there is inclusivity in all forms of transport and access. And just to answer that question about um, the government, it's worth remembering that Michael Gove used to be um, you know, <laughs> the Minister for um, Environment, and actually he did show quite a lot of commitment there so I'm intrigued to see how he brings that understanding about the value of environment into his work, um, his current portfolio, um, certainly on how he strengthens the commitment to the environment, um, but also on how we get more sustainable planning, because that's going to be a big part of his work. And as for levelling up, well, um, that's interesting. In a way, it's a phrase that's been used for what we're all doing now, and that's creating a fairer um, platform for people. Uh, and, you know, been from Yorkshire, as you can probably hear from my accent, um, I can say, yes, more money in the north, but actually living in London for the last two decades, I'd say London is not the gobbler of um, finances. It requires what it needs and it gets what it needs, but I'd like that to happen to other cities too. Sally, mm, yeah, please. Yes, um, that's, that's an interesting question, and it's a question we struggle with a lot in Belfast because right now we just published our new vision for the city centre, and it is about a more sustainable place. We need to look at the balance of needs in a city centre. We need to have servicing and access. We need um, It needs to be equal for people to be able to access the city centre. Just like Maria said, you don't want to start pushing people out. So this is a very live discussion for us about how do we balance the different needs of a city in terms of parking and cars and walking, wheeling and cycling in Belfast to do this. And it, it's not straightforward. It, 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 is, it is about hard decisions. It's about how do we create networks of streets and places for people. But still, we do need to always have this type of servicing for the the city and there's a there's a couple things here servicing and urban logistics for cities does isn't going to remain the same it doesn't necessarily need to be big lorries all the time through cities so like one of the things we're doing is we're running a pilot right now of e-cargo delivery so we're trying to make streets at a more human scale for people to enable that servicing we're working with our business improvement districts to help business those particular areas and work with the private sector to shape what is best to drive footfall and to develop their own economies. So this, this collaboration between public, private investment, as well as listening to citizens, we're doing a huge amounts of stakeholder engagement. And that is really, really critical as you shape a city. It's not really simply about a plan for the city. It's about people in the city and how people move about the city and how they're going to live there. And, and that's where really the, we're keeping our eyes on the prize about building density and a population in Belfast that's sustainable, but is diverse, 
because that actually helps address some of the problems of Belfast is our lack of diversity sometimes. So, so I think this is complex. It's not straightforward. So you're always kind of balancing, balancing this and, and we're in the middle of it right now. Yeah. And it, 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 Jim, a, a lot of these issues that we're talking about, um, uh, there, there needs, there seems to be um, a need to scale up. So whether it's in terms of planning or it's in terms of uh, funding models, it's it's unifying um, uh, 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 thought and plans to be able to um, uh, get the right backing behind them. And I just wonder whether you think um, there's a challenge at the moment with quite a lot of disparate ideas about how to reach certain goals or uh, even definitions of sustainability, what, what one area might counter sustainable, one would prioritise other things. Is that a challenge at the moment for, for reaching the, the net zero goals that we have? Um, I think it probably is a challenge. Um, I mean, I think the, the UK government did well to be more or less the first to have a net zero target and to enshrine it in law, which not all countries have done. So that was that was a good kind of first mover advantage, I think. Um, it's looking a little bit fuzzy now after all this time. And there's been you know a lot of response on the part of different local authorities, different private sector organisations to also adopt net zero policies. Um, with everyone trying to be more ambitious, and rightly so, because we have to be um, ambitious, but it, it does give quite a kind of maybe an inconsistent playing field now, and maybe a degree of inconsistency um, in terms of how the market might respond. And I think it depends on maybe how local authorities decide to do things. We've worked with the West Midlands Combined Authority on their net zero action plan. Um, Big, big combined authority, big geography, um, you know, powerful place, big population can do a lot, can bring a lot of funding to bear. We're working with Bradford at the moment. They're developing a clean growth strategy. Um, smaller city, but very ambitious. They want to be the UK's first clean growth city. Um, and they're going to kind of make sure all their investment decisions are, are aligned to that. I mean, I think uh, the scaling up, the scaling up question comes down to two things. I think it's kind of clarity of the policy agendas and clarity of the regulator, clarity of the regulatory environment. That's a central government thing. But it's also about the funding. It's about the kind of consistency and long-term nature of the funding. And we've already talked about, you know, the scale of the funding available for from government. Is it the same as we had pre-Brexit now? Is domestic government going to create the same volume of funding? That's one question. But it's also how that funding is deployed. And when we look at things like sustainability, net zero um, agendas, when we look at levelling up, when we look at um, the kind of the, the regeneration of talent centres, high streets, it's lots and lots and lots of funding pots. And if you're working in a local authority, you probably spend 90% of your time on funding applications for all these different individual pots. And I'm just thinking, you know, when I look at the West Midlands Combined Authority, it's a big authority. Can we do more devolving the funding and the control of the fiscal resources to the local area so that things can maybe maybe be more nuanced and the relationship with the local sub-regional private sector could be stronger as a result of that because things are maybe localised in a different way. And I think that will help with the scaling up. It will help with getting funding into innovations and getting business cre businesses created and the products generated and the products into the market to do all of this. So I think maybe some kind of more localization of the whole funding and finance regime might help there. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we've had um, we've had a question come through that I want to throw to each one of the the panelists, and it's about COP twenty six and uh, whether um, you believe that it will lead to a positive impact on just transition to net zero in the built environment. Um, Stuart, I want to go around the group. I'll, I'll start with you. How how uh, how optimistic are you about the, the potential impacts of COP26? Well, well, first, it's great that it's coming to Scotland. And I think Scotland was the, the home in some ways of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it's good that the, the new Industrial Revolution, which is net zero, is, is really going to kick off, I think, in, in Scotland and in, in Glasgow. Um, yeah, the Scottish government is hugely committed to, to net zero. Every agency has been tasked with thinking about net zero and its role. Certainly in Scotland, local authorities are embracing it. We do produce huge amounts of renewable energy. But one, one challenge we've got actually is that it costs the people who supply renewable energy onto the network in Scotland are charged significant sums. Whereas if you're doing an offshore wind farm in England, you're actually subsidised to do it. 
which doesn't make sense and it runs completely counter to, to levelling up because we've got huge resources in Scotland around renewables. And if you look at the, the North Sea, that, that basically oil and gas infrastructure can be used for carbon capture in the future and can also um, be used around hydrogen production. So I, I'm very optimistic about the potential for Scotland. I think the world has to wake up. There's there's a need for massive investment. I think there's a hundred billion pound fund for developing countries, but that's really a drop in the ocean. So if, if this is going to happen, we need to get serious about the finance of this. But in terms of Scotland, I think we're, we're well placed and we've got leadership, uh, particularly from the Scottish government. Thanks. Yeah, Maria, how um, how optimistic are you feeling about COP26? Um, I think you have to stay optimistic. I mean, in, in another life, I, I focus on environmental justice and environment. And, you know, I see many COPs and sometimes they can actually create some real difference in policy and investment. Um, you know, if everything goes ahead, I, I'd like to see uh, governments and governments that recognise that we can't just keep using the same phrase for net zero and saving the world. But as colleagues said earlier, we really need to invest locally as well, because I think at a local level, there's that knowledge equity where leaders and communities understand where the funding needs to be. Um, so I think that needs to be part of that central conversation. I'm, I'm intrigued as to what happens um, out of this COP, but I think, I hope we walk away with something that makes sense for all of us and actually will save the planet and places and people. Fingers crossed, though. Absolutely, I think we'd all echo that. Um, uh, Sean, what, what are you hoping to, to hear or see at COP26? I see COP26 as a pivotal moment in the world and it will be remembered. Uh, this isn't just... Uh, the, the built environment that's listening to this. I was reading something uh, over the weekend about the Pope was also say, pushing people to consider the, the environmental aspects and how this affects people. So I do see it as a pivotal moment in how it, the world is changing. And I, I've found, I'm sure we all have on, on this uh, webinar today, that we've all changed as a result of what's happened with COVID. We're all thinking, actually, the environment matters. So this is coming at a perfect time for us to think about it. And the other thing which we're also all realising, which is me as a civil engineer, I think uh, other engineers, and, but sustainability means flooding. We're experiencing more sites and more locations. If it's every site that we're involved in, redevelopment on Merseyside and throughout the UK has a flooding issue. So if we don't actually take it seriously, we'll find that more homes flood. So I think even though COP26 is obviously around promoting this and discussing it, it's going to be forced upon us. So I, I see it as a pivotal change in how we view the problem. Right, thanks, Sean. Uh, Callie, some thoughts about COP26? Sure. Um, like everyone else, I, I think it's a great opportunity. I, I also think it's particularly good because for in Belfast, there's particular events for young people. And so we see the climate strikes on Fridays and, and that's good, but that energy is really important to sustain this as a movement uh, through policy, through making tangible changes in our, our lives. But it's, it's, it is about individual choices, absolutely. But it's also about big businesses changing because we can change all we want, but there's real big issues around carbon um, emitters. And in Belfast, our biggest challenges are around buildings and retrofitting and transport. And so, yes, we can make an impact on that as individuals, but COP26 is really important to start perhaps teasing out what are the tangible things, what are the next to do things that we need to do as a city, because it is good to have this place-based focus. I think, I think that's really helpful, but putting it in a wider global context helps connect a place small like Belfast of 340,000 people connect to wider global goals. And so I think that's one of the big benefits is that we are small places that we can do things, but we need to connect in because we have a net zero map for the city. But Belfast as a small region is put within the UK. It is we we can do so much, but we do, we also do need this kind of wider strategic governmental vision. Yeah, so would you would you agree with that, Jim? It's um I guess everyone is particularly from a Western Europe or um, a UK perspective, we're kind of all on the same page now in terms of sustainability, but it needs to go beyond rhetoric into to hard action, I guess, right? 
Um, I think that's right. Um, I mean, like everyone else, I think you've got to go into COP26 being positive with a positive frame of mind and determined to get something positive um, out of it. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's a governmental event and trying to get governments of the world to agree with each other is going to be quite a challenge, I think. And it has been very challenging at previous COPs, I think, including the last one. So uh, it remains to be seen. But I think... Um, um, yeah, just on the point that you've made, the point that Callie made as well, it's um, the the urgency now in the next decade is to is to move forward and to take kind of decisive action and to implement things. And I think at the moment um, there's a kind of a bit of a reliance on the part of governments that as in as individuals we will change our behaviour, companies will sign up to things. Um, and that you know the technologies will get invented and and deployed, but in order to move as quickly as it needs to, I think there probably needs to be more in the way of a kind of a regulatory environment that does push things forward quickly, and that needs to come with money. It needs to come with a blend of private and and public sector money. And I think one of the ways to maybe speed that up is you know, the private finance will flow into things when the risk profile looks okay. We don't know how long that's going to take for a lot of these nascent and emerging technologies. So if that can somehow be underwritten by government through a blended form of finance, government and private sector coming together to create funds, which can then be used locally to reflect all these kind of local, the local knowledge and the local nuance, I think that would help as well. But um, yes, uh, yeah, we need to be positive and you know, support the whole COP26 efforts, of course. Absolutely. Um, a, a, a bit of a... A pet question from me here. So, um, as I say, I think most uh, businesses and governments are, are, are singing from the same uh, hymn sheet now. I wonder we are experiencing in, in the UK what has been described as uh, a, a energy crisis, or at least an, a, a crisis at the petrol pumps for uh, large parts of the country. Um, and you could uh, describe that as part of uh, a consequence as part of the energy transition. Um, gas prices are, are likely to get continue to get higher as there's um, less uh, global production. Um, the ultimate destination we're getting to is where we need to get to. I just wonder, not not just in a, in a, in a grand sense, but also at very local levels, um, how willing local communities and individuals are to pay for net zero and to um, and to uh, meet the costs of uh, our ambitions to uh, uh, around sustainability. And do we think? Do we worry that there may be a conflict there in future? Or from your experience, to to um, uh, uh, your your average person on the street, are they you think are, are prepared for the challenges that lie ahead, and 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 will be willing to to meet any costs that there then may be? So, Stuart, I might start with you on that. Thanks. Yeah, the the um, issues with uh, petrol shortages weren't weren't the same in Scotland. I think there was less less panic buying. There was some in the central belt, but uh, in the more it's interesting in the more rural areas where you're more fuel dependent, if you like, people were more sensible about it. it seemed to be uh, an urban phenomenon. But um, I think I think the point you're making is is Im important. But there are differential costs on different parts of society, and I think um, a colleague from Liverpool, Sean, already mentioned the issue of fuel poverty. And, it, and it's a great unfairness that in an energy rich country like Scotland and, and like parts of the UK, we actually face some really, really high energy bills and particularly they, they impact on the on the poorest parts of society. So that is a real a real challenge, I think. And, and that's where, again, Sean mentioned the, the need for insulation and home improvements. There's huge scope for, for job creation in that. Um, we, we also have a challenge in Scotland because large parts of our economy are dependent on the oil and gas sector, particularly around Aberdeen and the North East. And the Scottish Government recognises that and they've put £500 million into what they're calling a just transition fund. So that's to try and avoid the problems that um, affected parts of England and indeed parts of Scotland when the, the coal mines were closed in the, in the 80s and communities were left behind. And some of those communities are still left behind, as, as colleagues will be aware. So, yeah, I think people are willing to pay a bit more, but that depends on their ability to pay. 
and we need to help and support the, the poorest in society so that it doesn't affect them more. And that's particularly the case in an area like ours, Highlands and Islands, where you know you probably haven't put your central heating on yet. Um, if you live in the north of Scotland, it's much more of an issue. We're starting to get into cold uh, evenings and, and people need their heating on and people working from home or being at home more, uh, that's obviously an added cost. So I think we do have to help support the poorest in society in making this transition and also help areas that are more affected by the, the demise of the old sectors and get them into the new ones. Thanks. Anyone else wants to jump in there about um, uh, cost implications of, of the energy transition? Well, um, it's going to be it's going to be pretty crucial, isn't it? The thing is, we it's not a level it's not a level playing field here. Um, you know, as Sean and Stuart said, actually, it, arguably, you know, people on low incomes have paid for a lot of the environmental policies and changes, um, and so high costs on fuel um, for some people that will have an impact on their ability to find a job, to get a job. Um, and I think there has to be a kind of equitable solution. There's no way that we can have a sustainable, inclusive sort of policy agenda or a COP26 that agrees for everyone to have, um, to be equally liable economically for paying for this, mm. not just in the North, not just in London, not just in other cities and places, but also globally. You know, the argument is that the North has you know, created this um, you can't exp and wealthy countries or areas have done this. Um, not meaningful. Um, and so actually, it's not fair to expect those without those resources who've been impacted most to pay for it. And that goes towards actually how we work with other countries, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, who are really struggling with this, as well as some of the poor cities in the UK. I don't know, right? we, we're, we're into our last couple of minutes, but does anyone else I just, I just wanted to pick up on Maria's point there about um, equity, because I think are people willing to pay for net zero? I think um, some some are, some aren't. Uh, and I think that's kind of going to be dealt with by government regulating and starting to introduce things like carbon pricing, which to, to push us away from the, the kind of high carbon consumption and towards low carbon consumption. But there are, there's always a risk of kind of distortionary impacts where you, you kind of create disadvantages for people who are already disadvantaged, who need to rely on fossil fuels or who don't have a job yet. And, you know, there's kind of things Maria talked about. So there's a very careful kind of policy agenda that needs to be worked through about how we kind of nudge everyone towards net zero, but don't do it in a way that imposes additional negative impacts on people who are already challenged in their lives, I think. Yes, and if I could jump in, I, I agree completely with this this discussion. It's very interesting about the disproportionate impact of climate, and it's about also then how do those communities benefit from the changes mm. too. For example, air quality, congestion, health expectation, you know, your health outcomes, because our surrounding city centre communities where road infrastructure is at its worst, suffer the negative impacts of, of this. So when once we can start making tangible changes that benefit people, I think people's behavior also, you'll get more buy-in. People will want to go down this road, but we can't expect those communities that suffer the most to solve the problem of climate, you know. Thanks. Um, Sean, I don't know, um, the only one we didn't come to for this question, we've got literally about a minute no problem um i think one thing i would like to say is that we're actually on a on a roadmap towards net zero so we're actually moving there so we're not actually there and it's going to take us some some time and the I actually believe that most people have changed. Most people want to contribute. We all want to contribute at different weight rates. Um, so I'm hoping that to be back here in five years' time and saying that we're on the roadmap, we're 50% the way there. And that, uh, that chat that we had uh, back in October was well worthwhile. So thank you. Brilliant. Um, well, I don't think there's much more for me to say there. Thank you to all of the panellists for uh, your time today. Um, great discussion. We could have gone on longer, but we really have run out of time. So I need to pass back over to Bonnie now. Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, thank you so much to our panel for very wide ranging, insightful and quite deep and passionate discussion. It definitely left me with some food for thought for the day. And um, Sean, I'm glad you left it on an optimistic note. We'll look forward to the 
five year reunion in the <laughs> back here for hopefully maybe an in-person event as well. Um, so looking ahead audience, uh, we'd be delighted to see you tuning in some of our other sessions today. Um, details of what's coming up now are on your screen. Um, there's a few different panels taking place, focusing on different places. Um, a lot of them will be tied to the Net Zero agenda, but um, also focusing on uh, social infrastructure, culture and community. Um, so we've got a session on Chichester, uh, the first time Chichester has been part of Real Estate Live, so a really interesting new place to um, take some interest in, have a look at what they've been doing down there. It's, a really, it's going to be a really insightful um, panel with several members of the District Council taking place, uh, taking part even, sorry. Then we've got a session with um, Hammersmith Bid about um, public realm and infrastructure. Um, we've got a lunchtime talk with uh, the leasing director at Unibel Redenco Westfield, which should be um, yeah an interesting one to maybe have your lunch with. Um, and then we have a panel about driving investment into West London, um, which is all about digital places and digital infrastructure. So a um, very wide ranging uh, programme for today, but hopefully we'll see you tuning into some of those. Um, and all that remains for me to say is thank you again for joining us this morning. And before we log off, um, we've just got a short video we're going to play, um, which is in partnership with our wellness partner, Therma Group. Um, just to remind everyone to make sure they take a break from their screen and um, focus on their mental health during the day. So enjoy that and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.